think uh, I think uh, Good evening and welcome to our evening service. I particularly want to thank those of you uh, last week who very kindly helped uh, tidy up after the wedding. Uh, Stuart and Alice were in church this morning. Incredibly grateful to all of you for doing that. And uh, they had a lovely couple of days away and they looked very happy. Together. So that was great. Thank you. It was an enormous help to those that were flagging on their feet. So thank you. I wonder what's your favourite place in the world? There is a place. I'm not going to tell you where because you'll spoil it. There is a place I sit down and I look out and I go, all is well with my soul. It's just beautiful and uh, appeals to me. Uh, the, the Lord has made a staggeringly wonderful world. Incredibly beautiful. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. And so we're going to marvel at God's creative hand. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder...
please do be seated as we join together in prayer. Father, we thank you for your wonderful creation. We thank you that it reveals what a glorious God you are. We thank you for the times that we can sit in it and feel all is well with my soul. The times where we've seen the staggering beauty and your creative imagination and we've just wanted to exclaim, God, you are awesome. We thank you that you have given us a wonderful world to live in. We thank you that it reflects your character and draws us into your presence. As we think this evening about how we are to respond to the environment, Lord, we pray that we would truly have righteous dominion. In Jesus' name, amen. We might like to uh, open our Bibles to that familiar passage in Genesis 1. And if someone would very kindly read uh, verses 26 to 31, that would be great. 26 to 31. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. You want one, Kathy? Uh, I'm afraid there was a misprint on this slide. It dragged it all over to one end. But it's still legible, particularly in the back. Great, thank you, Donald. <coughs> Jan Borsema describes the collapse of civilization on Easter Island as probably not nearly so abrupt or catastrophic as many assume. The island was gradually deforested, but the changes occurred slowly. The result was not a sudden collapse, but rather a slow decline in the wealth, variety of food, and cultural richness of the society. This created a gradual socio-cultural transition of which the inhabitants themselves may not even have been particularly aware while they were in the midst of it. Much the same might be said of environmental changes happening today. This phenomenon ought to warn us of the very real risk 
of sleepwalking into a situation where we unknowingly impact our environment to such an extent that its former richness and the way it benefits life is lost forever. Care for the environment, though, has been a comparatively recent phenomenon. Public awareness was brought to the fore by a series of four disasters. You probably remember them. Bhopal in 84, Chernobyl 86, uh, the Sandoz factory pollution of the Rhine in 86, and then the Exxon Valdez in Prince William Sound in 89. And really the 80s kind of mark uh, an awakening where green issues move from the margins to the centre of political debate. And it's remarkable how quickly a dedicated campaigning minority have succeeded in, alarm, uh, in alerting the public on green issues. We're all aware. Deforestation of the Amazon, depletion of the ozone layer, carbon offset, problems of microplastics. We may not understand them, but we've all heard the language of them. One quarter of the world's, world's population lives in poverty and extremely vulnerable to changes caused by drought or flooding to the failure of agricultural crops to rising sea levels. If we take care of our global neighbour, love our neighbour as ourself, we need to consider the impact or the possible impact our lives might have on other people elsewhere. So uh, one person wrote, our decision to drive a big car, to fly to Paris for the weekend, I wish, or to turn the heating up rather than put a jumper on, may direct impact, uh, directly impact on someone already living on the edge. Bring your jumper to the manse. Three things I want to look at this evening. Why bother? Why don't we bother? And how to bother? And then I want to finish with a story of hope. <coughs> Actually, it might be two stories of hope. We'll see how time is going. So the first thing I want to look at is why bother? From a worldly perspective, four things significantly challenge us. And I think we're all aware of the challenge of population growth. The growth rate is accelerating uh, and ever more people are born into destitution. We face the challenge of feeding an expanding population. Secondly, as the population expands, resource depletion continues. There are finite resources to go around. This is a tiny planet. Thirdly, we live in an age of runaway technology that's extremely greedy for fuel. How can we feed this insatiable need? Just think about it. When you were young, you had one car per family, possibly. Now parked on our driveways can be three or four cars. How many mobile phones in the household? Computers, all manner of electric devices. Our, our consumption and our runaway technology has transformed our living. Fourthly, sorry. Fourthly, as most of us are aware, we live with a damaged atmosphere and constantly face the challenge of pollution. All those that, all those that model what the future may hold, even if some of their assumptions are highly debatable, make for grim reading. As far back as 1972, futurologists, yes, some people get paid for predicting the future, Futurologists were demanding zero growth as the only solution. Yet humanity will not stay still. What should be our unique Christian response? The Bible gives three main reasons why we should care for the environment. First, creation was made by Jesus, through Jesus, and for Jesus. We get that from Colossians 1. He sustains it at all time. Without him, it would fall apart into chaos, 
He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And I think that's a stunning declaration of the worth of this planet. The material world matters to God. So if we neglect it, abuse it, spoil the environment, we're damaging something precious to God. I uh, looked out of the window yesterday and some wretched creature had bitten the head off my one iris and it lay on the floor. I felt gutted. And I, as I stood there, knowing I was going to do environmentalism on Sunday, I thought, I think that's just a, a snapshot of how God must feel when we don't take creation care seriously. The second and even more important reason why we should care for the environment is found in Genesis 1, 28 and 2, 15, as we're told to care for creation. Being made in the image of God defines our relationship with the whole of creation. We are God's representatives and how we relate either brings or does not bring glory to God. We're told we're to fill the earth and subdue it or have dominion over it. And dominion is something we've been very successful at. We are to have dominion though without abusing it for our own selfish ends. If we don't in, uh, exercise dominion correctly, dominion becomes domination. The earth does not belong to us. It belongs to God. And we're simply charged to take care of it. So we should care for the environment that reflects the glory in a way that reflects the glory of God and is our proper worship. I'm planting my flowers in a nice straight line it is my act of worship to God. You can part, plant yours randomly, but I think God likes nice straight lines. We are to love this world and bring glory to God through it. The third reason is that one day the cosmos will be renewed and recreated as the new heavens and new earth to which the, both the Old Testament and New Testament look forward. And that will bring the fullness of life that God intended and purpose for his creation. A place where people will truly be at home where both they and the whole of creation will worship him and give him glory. How we live right now should reflect something of how we live in the future. Why are we trying to be more holy people? Because we want to be more like what we're going to be when we get to glory. Now, if glory is going to involve a new heaven and a new earth, surely our care for the world should be the same as our care for our character. You get me? Right. Luther is supposed to have remarked, if I knew Jesus would return tomorrow, I'd plant a tree today. Or a row of irises. Whatever, it was just that expression of care. The second thing I want to look at is why we don't bother. Economist Peter Hill uses the term ecological hysteria to refer to a common technique of the environmental extremists. As Hill explains, the news is continually filled with stories of where the next disaster is coming from and how we're on the brink of destruction from one catastrophic event to another. Pesticide poisoning, global warming, acid rain, asbestos, radon and an electromagnetic radiation are among the many dangers that are about to overtake us. And we're con cajoled into action through the rhetoric of fear. Is it ecological hysteria 
and the rhetoric of fear that causes some just to go, hey, I'm not going to be manipulated. Back off. Or that kind of exaggerated language that causes us to be helpless and not act. Uh, and the language used to describe it can either render us inactive or just go, I don't believe it. We were sat with people on Friday and uh, one person said, uh, well, I think they've exa uh, there's a conspiracy theory around vaccines. I sat there scratching my head going, you're an intelligent, rational human being. But they come from America where fake news is just big news. Everything's fake. And so we can have this hermeneutic of suspicion. The second thing I wonder if we're aware of is it's your fault. You being anyone who's a Christian. In 1967, Lynn White argued that the Judeo-Christian tradition was the cause of our ecological crisis. His accusation has been reprinted in numerous textbooks and other anthologies and is the main reason college students learn that Christians are the problem. God planned all of this explicitly for man's benefit and rule. No item in the physical creation had any purpose save to serve man's purposes. It's what they're taught. As White's assessment of the Christian attitude towards God's creation. Ian McCarr continued this salt, describing dominion as a horrifying line in Genesis 1. If you want to find one text uh, of uh, compounded horror, which will guarantee that the relationship of man to nature can only be destruction, which will atrophy and uh, any creative skill which will explain all of the destruction and all of the uh, desperation accomplished by Western man for the last 2,000 years, then you do not have to look any further than this ghastly, calamitous text. Francis Schaeffer was among the first Christian apologists to respond to White. The Christian is called upon to exhibit his dominion, but exhibit it rightly, treating the thing as having value in itself, exercising dominion without being destructive. And I think we'd all say, yes, Schaefer, you're right. But I dare to suggest that even as far back as 1554, John Calvin had interpreted dominion to mean a responsible care and keeping that does not neglect, injure, abuse, degrade, dissipate, corrupt, mar, or ruin the earth. I would dare to suggest that throughout the course of human history, Christians have said it's responsible care that do, the word dominion means, not domination or spoiling. The trouble is... We all struggle to ex exercise dominion in a responsible way. Human sin often means that dominion becomes domination. Our endless curiosity, and we have an insatiable curiosity, means that what is technologically possible, even though it's morally questionable, becomes what we want to have a go at. And I want to highlight six things where distorted Christian belief can influence the way we respond to the environment. The first challenge is the belief that the earth belongs to humanity. We possibly wouldn't say that. The earth belongs to God. But some people would see it as God gave the earth over to us. <clears throat> and when we recover the doctrine that the earth is the Lord's, we cannot exploit creation to our own ends, just as we wouldn't abuse our neighbour's property. We wouldn't abuse God's property because the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The second challenge 
is the belief that the material world is unimportant or e evil. It ran through Greek thought, you know, kind of the physical life isn't important. What really matters is the spiritual life. And it comes from the, this belief that permeated some Christian thought that only what is truly spiritual matters. But when we recover a theology that the creation is good, loved by God, we begin to understand it really does matter how we treat it. As it's inconceivable to honour Rembrandt and yet despises paintings, so also it's inconceivable to honour the creator and despises creation. To the creator of matter, matter matters. To the creation of matter, matter matters. The third challenge is the belief that Christians who care for the environment are environmentalists. And we can develop a theology of creation care where we avoid lumping all who care for creation into the uh, category of environmentalist. It kind of is a tainted word, isn't it? Well, it might be positive in your mind, but in many people's minds, it's not a healthy word. Where the suspicions of pantheism, paganism, violent tactics, and certain political leanings. The fourth challenge is the belief that environmentalists and New Agers and New Agers are, are to be avoided. And we need to recover the theology that all need to hear the gospel. We don't avoid certain sections of society, but we want to reach out to the good news, with the good news to every group, even if it's a challenge. The fifth challenge is the belief that there is no environmental crisis. Creation care is unnecessary or exaggerated, and some is. Can shoot me later for those three words but we need to be set free free from that hermeneutic of suspicion that demands more evidence when uh, and only then can we move to a reason response the sixth challenge is your eschatology what you believe about end times see if you have a theology that things says things are only going to get worse well, we're going to get worse, so why bother? If you have a theology that says things are only going to get better, it depends on what you believe about the end times and the thousand-year reigns, you don't really need to do very much because they're going to get better. But if you have a theology of responsibility, then we need to care. What we believe about end times influences our behavior and response. D.L. Moody said, I look upon this world as a sinking ship and the Lord has given me a lifeboat and told me, Moody, save all you can. In his view, the only thing that can be retrieved from the wreckage of the world is individual souls. The earth itself is beyond redemption. It's going to get worse. Why bother? Others believe that life on earth will only get better. We're less like the Titanic doomed to destruction and more like the Queen Mary sailing off into a glorious sunset. What's your theology? And how is it affecting your response to the environment? Our society is discovering that environmental problems... I dare to suggest, are more spiritual than technological. Though the world may not use the language of sin, we're seeking, seeing how broken and selfish people's behaviour is. As this reality becomes apparent, people everywhere are looking for the way, the truth and the life. And surely, as God's people, we want to speak into this. Not the excesses of environmentalism, but the opportunity to speak the truth into what people are seeking. The time is right for offering the living water that only Christ gives to a world as an expression of God's love. And if we have a positive theology of care, uh, creation care, 
will be able to speak life and hope into people's lives. To make the most of the opportunity. Proverbs 31.9 says, Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. We're called as Christians to stand up for justice, calling on those in positions of power to make decisions that protect the most vulnerable people on earth. So let's not ignore the impact our behaviour may have on our brothers and sisters across the world, but let us strive towards a response one step at a time. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. How do you respond more responsibly to creation care? One decision at a time. Let's not be extreme, but let's make a decision that is manageable and sustainable going forward. I wonder what's the last decision you made to be more environmentally careful. Uh, many of the practical things are not very difficult. Walking to church. Oh, some of us feel very good about ourselves this evening. <laughs> Changing to low energy light bulbs, switching off the TV when it's on standby, insulating your homes, they, they all are beneficial to us, aren't they? Particularly with the rising electricity costs, switching things off. But sometimes we just find it so difficult to make one small choice because at our heart is the problem of sin. And we're just so selfish. We need to put creation care in the context of loving our neighbour. It is a spiritual exercise. I, I know the language around the environment can be quite extreme. So I wanted to end with two stories. In 1995, the grey wolf was reintroduced to Yellowstone National Park after a 70-year absence. Wolves are predators that kill certain species of animals, but they indirectly give life to others. When the wolves re-entered the ecological equation, it radically changed the behavioural pattern of other wildlife. As the wolves began killing coyotes, the rabbit and moose populations increased thereby attracting more hawks, weasels, foxes and badgers. In the absence of predators, deers had overpopulated the park and overgrazed parts of Yellowstone. Their new traffic patterns, however, allowed the flora and fauna to regenerate. The berries on those regenerated shrubs caused a spike in bear, the bear population. In six years' time, the trees in overgrazed parts of the park had quintupled in height. Bear valleys were reforested with aspen, willow and cottonwood trees. As soon as that happened, songbirds started nesting in the trees. Then beavers started chewing them down. Beavers are ecosystem engineers building dams that create natural habitats for otters, muskrats and ducks, as well as fish, reptiles and amphibians. The wolves even changed the behaviour of rivers. They meandered less because of less soil erosion. The channels narrowed, pools formed as they regenerated forests stabilised by riverbanks. And I, I, I've got to say, in the midst of all the historical, re, uh, historical, hysterical rhetoric about environmentalism, I, we need to read the good news. That actually one small action can have a profound effect. I think we're probably all aware of the problem of microplastics. Are you aware that there are microorganisms that break down microplastics? Scientists have discovered them. And uh, I marvel, that's not to say we shouldn't behave responsible, responsibly. I marvel at how God seems to have 
allowed the earth to regenerate itself despite man's worst efforts. And I wonder what that says, despite all the hysterical stories. So I've given you a couple of questions to chew over. I don't think it's all bad news. I think some of it is good news. Some of it is exciting news, if you like wolves and live in Yellowstone National Park. Um, but I perhaps you'd like to think about where you are and what your response should be. I'll give you about 10 minutes.
today, but uh, our first response is, but he is worthy. Thank you, Donald. I know. Who said that? Who are you? Can't see you. It's too dark. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Oliver. You lead Shall us. I start? Shall Thank I start? you.
just like us to uh, pray for our response. Uh, I'd like us to pray for our, our consuming uh, the uh, engineering magazine that landed on the doorstep on Saturday morning. Uh, that's Hillary's engineering magazine, not mine. Uh, was wrapped in potatoes. Well, actually, it wasn't really wrapped in potatoes. It was wrapped in a cellophane made from potatoes. And it's amazing what people can do. It's fully biodegradable. It's incredible what people have come up with as solutions. Uh, so pray for that. I once saw a program on the amount of food wastage that happens in some of the foreign countries that grow food for our supermarkets, you know, the Kenyas, places like this, which you can scratch your head. Is it worth consuming food produced in these countries that are struggling to feed themselves? And I think one of you at the front said the dilemma is but it gives farmers an opportunity that they wouldn't have. But uh, so much of it just goes to waste because it doesn't conform to the perfect standard for the British market. And uh, I rejoice that you can now buy wonky fruit. It doesn't matter on the size or shape. You can just get it what, without it perfectly conforming. I love wonky fruit. It's a bit like human beings. We're all wonky. <laughs> we don't conform together. and We all have a, a good time. So, you know, it's just perhaps changing attitudes. But we want to pray for our consumption we in the West are the major consumers, so let's pray for uh, wisdom and creative solutions. And I then just want to pray for those that are suffering. And I'm not apportioning blame to anything, even environmentalism. Uh, we, we just must have a compassion for our neighbor, wherever they are, who are suffering drought, famine, hardship. So I'd like us to pray for our consuming as consumers and then uh, those suffering. And I'm just going to turn over uh, that to one or two of you who'd like to lead us in prayer. And Father, we do pray for those people that are struggling because their environment is harsh. Father, we pray for those that are suffering drought and famine. Pray for those who are uh, suffering because of heavy rainfalls and flooding that has accompanied that. We pray for uh, 
us as consumers would make wise choices, but also for the people in those environments that they would too would understand and make wise choices about what they can do. We think of Easter Island and what happened there. And we pray that we can be aware of what's going on and do our best to preserve this uh, fragile earth. We thank you for the wonderful way that you've built into creation the ability to regenerate. We marvel at uh, how one decision to reintroduce a wolf can have a massive impact on habitat. Lord, we pray that uh, we would make good decisions. We thank you for the science and technology by which we've prospered. The uh, things that have enriched our lives. And we pray for the wisdom of those that are researching, that they would be led and guided towards solutions that bless our neighbour as well as ourselves. In Jesus' name. So we're going to close as we sing Creation Sings the Father's Song.
the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let's live for God's glory as we care and love his creation. Amen.